Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining this uh, new session of our Cloud Native New York uh, meetup. Today, we have with, we have with us uh, Adrian uh, Goillo. I hope that I didn't butcher uh, your surname. He is co-founder and core contributor for uh, the solution that we're going to talk about today. The company is uh, QuickWit, and they have a new approach to search for uh, log and management of, and analytics around the topic. So if you are looking for an alternative for Elasticsearch, you want to listen to this. And Adrian. Thanks, Gabri. Uh, yeah, so I'm Adrian Gillo. You did not butcher my name. Uh, <laughs> I've been working on QuickWit for two years now. It's, uh, it's an open source project that started in 2021. Um, I'm a software engineer with um, a decade of experience. And my last job at a software company was at Airbnb where I was uh, working in a data infrastructure team working on their data warehouse. So, but today we're not gonna talk about data warehousing, we're gonna talk about search engine. Um, they wanna talk about QuickWit, but especially um, yeah, the novel architecture uh, that QuickWit uses to offer a cloud native search engine for distributed tracing, log management analytics, and in general, um, QuickWit is a good fit for everything that's immutable. So when you think about immutable data, obviously you think about logs, but it can be basically any events that once it's sent, it's not modified. Uh, but you, call, you also can think about emails, text, uh, conversation data is a, is a really good use case for, for QuickWit. Um, QuickWit is built on top of a indexing library called TenTV that was also uh, created by the, the founders of um, QuickWit. It's a library written in Rust, um, and it's the equivalent of the, in the Rust world of what is Lucene in the Java world. So almost all the search engine in the Java world, so Elasticsearch, OpenSearch, Solar, uh, uh, built on top of Lucene. Uh, and so TenTV is the equivalent of Lucene. Uh, only returning Rust and on average twice as fast. Uh, but what's really different about QuickWit is, is the first search engine to decouple storage from compute. So what does it mean? Um, it's, it's been, a, I feel like it's been a buzzword uh, for, the last, for the last few years. Everybody wants to decouple storage from compute. Um, and so it's a trend that started in the data warehouse space. Uh, Snowflake made it really, really popular. So uh, I feel like when we say decoupling storage from compute, a lot of people think about Snowflake, but actually like some other companies uh, moved their data warehouse to S3 before Snow Snowflake did. I'm thinking about in particular uh, about Netflix. So like, like the name implies, it means that you compute and storage are no longer tied together. So you have a storage layer that can grow independently from the compute layer. Uh, and basically it boils down to adopting a new architecture. Uh, and that architecture is sometimes called stateless, sometimes, sometimes called shared disk architecture. And so today, basically mo most of this presentation is about what is show nothing, the architecture when, where you don't decouple storage and compute, what are the pros and cons of that architecture, and what is show nothing, uh, show disk, uh, and same, same thing, what are the pros and cons, what allows you to go from one to the other. So first, I'm going to talk about show nothing architecture. Uh, the name maybe doesn't ring a bell for you, but actually you if you, if you work in software engineering IT, you use a lot of systems that adopt this, this architecture. And so we said that a cluster, an architecture is shown nothing if the cluster is composed, composed of nodes that are independent from each other. They don't share resources. Uh, if they, because they don't share resources, you have no bottlenecks. You don't have contention trying to access the same resource. So that makes them usually pretty scalable. So the nodes do not share the same processor, the same memory or storage. They are only tied together, linked together through the network. 
And so in that world, data sets that you want to host, work on, uh, are divided in smaller chunks of data. And each node is responsible for a piece of the data set, usually called a partition or a shard. Um, some, some backends use different names, but mostly we talk about partitions and shards. And so the data set is uh, divided into chunks and the computations are divided also in smaller units of work, usually a called task. Um, and examples of such, are, such systems that use that architecture are, I think Hadoop in general with HDFS for storage and might reuse for computation, but also Cassandra, Elasticsearch. Uh, this is a very ubiquitous architecture and for good reason. And, all right, let's see. Let's see. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take a particular example for Elasticsearch uh, since today we're gonna talk about search engines. So uh, Elasticsearch uh, decomposed the data set. Uh, Elast in the search world, the data set is called an index because like the under underlying technologies like search uh, inverted in the indices. So we call the data set index. It's composed of many records, logs in search. We call them documents. You divide your index into shards. Shards are replicated for foot for foot tolerance and scalability. So if you look at, at a diagram, it just looks like this. Um, horizontally, you split your data set into shards. Vertically, you have replicas of the same shard. Um, and each node uses its own CPU, its own memory, its own storage to work on the shard. And so it's great for for tolerance. Um, if you have multiple replicas, you can afford to lose one replica and still you're still able to serve queries. So the number of replicas that a shard is called the replication factor. So the minimum you usually the minimum normally one is two, uh, very often three, uh, more rarely four, but that happens. So um, that's. Yes. Adrian, I just wonder, can you speak a little bit to the difference between partitions and shards? Uh, those, those are usually the same. Uh, so you could you could use uh, both in, uh, and interchange them. Like some some backends, they decide to use the word shards. Some backends, they, they decide to use the word partitions. But really, that means that it's a subset of the data. And so you, you, you yeah, you, you have your, your big data set that you want to manage in with mil different nodes. And to do so, you divide your data set in small pieces. And the small pieces call usually a partition or shot. So if you, if, if you, if you, so like replicas is for foot tolerance. You add replicas so you can lose nodes uh, without losing data and keep serving queries. Or you can, also add shards in the eventuality or of uh, adding data. So if your data set is growing, what you can do is just add more shards, more nodes and more shards usually. So that's the topology of your cluster. So if you do search and you, you issue a search query, what happens? Usually a node in the cluster uh, that is usually called the root node or the coordination node is being hit first with a query. And that node, what it does is it forwards the query to each of the replicas in the cluster. So, and that is in that instance, so we want to eat all the shards and we can, we can hit either replicas. So in that example, let's just say you have a, a query uh, that would eat that would hit the uh, shot one replica one, uh, shot two replica two, and shot three replica. Oh, there's a typo. It should be replica one. So each replica is going to ans answer the query locally, find the result locally, answer the root node, and the root node sometimes is going to do some uh, post processing. So. Uh, the most simple one is just like, it's, it's going to concat concatenate all the results. But maybe you asked to rank the, the results 
So each replica is going to respond with partial results that are sorted. And the root nodes or the coordinator nodes still, still need to apply a final sort to, that, to those intermediate results to uh, answer with the final result. So the search path is the read path. This is where you query data. And there's another path called the write path or indexing path. Um, and usually those, those system expose some sort of API where you, where you push data. You're gonna hit one again, usually a coordination node and that coordination node, depending usually on some ID of the data is going to identify through a hashing algorithm usually a consistent hashing algorithm, or sometimes a rendezvous hashing algorithm. It's gonna determine which is the right shard. So once the shard for the document is found, it's going, forward, it's going to forward the document to each replica and each, each replica is going to index locally the document and add it to the, to the index. So that's nothing architecture in a nutshell. So the, the advantages of sh should nothing architecture is fault tolerant. As long as you can replicate the data, you're fault tolerant. It is scalable. You can always like add more nodes to handle more partitions. Uh, and because like it's each, there's no, nothing is shared between the nodes. There's no, like I said before, there's no contention. So it scales pretty well. The only problem you can have is hotspot, which sometimes like, uh, a partition is basically more popular than the others. Uh, in other case, you have to find like a clever partitioning mechanism. But if you don't have a spot, if like the load is like evenly spread out, it's, it's, very, it's a very, very scalable architecture. What's really great also is the data doesn't move. Uh, only the query, which is small, and the result sets uh, who, who are small to uh, move. So you don't, you don't move much, much data around. Time to search is really good. So time to search is the uh, delay between a, between the moment the data was added and the moment the data was was queried, because you hit uh, nodes nodes locally and they work on SSDs, and everything is in usually everything is in is in memory. You can add the document pretty quickly to the index, and for the same reason, because like everything is there locally, and you know that because of the partitioning mechanism, you know that all the versions of the documents are on the same partition, you know that if you mutate the same document, you just have to work on just one partition. So it's also a good ar architecture for mutability. So the counts, the counts now, a big one, and that's why a lot of companies are, try, are trying to move from shared nothing architecture to shared disk architecture when the, systems, the system is compatible with it. Uh, they, since you can't scale the storage and compute uh, indep independently, it's really hard to optimize opti op op utilization. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take I'm gonna take an example. Let's just say you work on a large data set, and for compliance reason, you need to start you need to keep one year of data. Assume you decide, okay, for each uh, for each day, I'm gonna do one partition. So you have like 365 partitions. So your cluster needs to be as big enough to handle all, the, all those partitions. However, maybe internally, most of the queries are interested in like in the last 24 hours or the even let's say the last the last week. What that means is basically like only like seven, seven seven shards, so maybe like 14 replicas or like 21 replicas if your replication factor is, uh, is three. Yeah, so in that, in that example, like storage, storage is, uh, is going to be very well utilized. Like you can optimize like the amount of space uh, you have on your disk so that the, the disk, uh, the amount of space on your disk fit the size of the data set. However, you're still gonna have like on each of those machines that end up Query basically, you're still going to have like CPUs and memory that's basically not going to be used. So that's the main reason why people want to scale decompute, decouple storage and compute that, that, so they can like optimize utilization. Uh, another cons of the 
um, Shen-Nothing architecture in, in this uh, Elasticsearch uh, example is you need to index uh, on each replica. So that's that basically wastes some CPU. You're doing the same work. So if your replication factor is two, you index the same documents twice. If your replication factor is three, you index your document three times. So you, you waste a little bit of CPU there. Another, another thing is indexing and search happen on the same machines, but usually they have like different, they have different properties. Like for indexing, maybe you want like really beefy CPUs and, and this, whereas on the, on the search front, maybe you can fit everything in memory. So you don't need to have like those very, very large disk. Uh, if, if you have couple storage and compute, it's, it's really hard to specialize the hardware for uh, the different use cases. Um, and another kind of nothing architecture is like the operational complexity uh, that can come with uh, decreasing or um, increasing on the both shards. If you, if, if you Google uh, adding shards, uh, Elasticsearch or adding nodes, Cassandra, there's a bunch of like blog posts that tells you how to do it because usually it leads to operational complexity uh, and because it's not as straightforward as some your team needs to, to be trained to do that operation smoothly. Um, and because networks are getting, fa are getting faster in the last 20 years, um, shared disk architecture has, 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 has gotten traction, uh, especially with the availability of uh, cloud storage. So what is shared disk architecture? It's, it's, it, at the end of the day, it's pretty simple. You have like a storage tier that's responsible for um, storage um, and a compute tier that, that's responsible for compute. Um, and now you can scale them independently. Uh, you can specialize the hardware independently. So I could have uh, played with the diagram and like uh, maybe put like some SSDs on the CPUs and uh, maybe a big, a lot of memory in a compute. Um, also elasticity be becomes like easier. Like let's just say like you have like different, different teams that have like different compute needs in your company. Maybe you have like uh, a data scientist, data scientist team and they need a uh, GPU power. Maybe you, they can have like a small com compute cluster with GPUs for that. Uh, you can even shut it down maybe during the weekend if they don't use it uh, without impacting storage. And maybe you have another team that's uh, doing some other kind of computation uh, that needs maybe to be a bit more snappy. So you, you give them that maybe better, better, better networking capabilities, that kind of thing. So with that architecture, it's, really, it's much easier to adapt um, the, the hardware and the clusters uh, to the workload uh, uh, particularities. You were saying, sorry, Adrian, that if you, um, the example you gave of shutting down compute while people like uh, separating storage and compute and you can mm -hmm. shut down the compute, would that be sort of motivated by cost savings? Yeah. Yeah, okay. usually usually it's, it's usually it's motivated by cost saving or like efficiency. Um, but like if you if you if you take if you come back to uh, yeah if you come back to that that example and like all your data is on is on disk like let's just say you are I don't know uh, B two B your B two B business so your app is mostly used uh, during the week when Bell used during weekends you have no possible you have no way to shut down your cluster during the weekend because the data is on the cluster if you shut down the cluster you shut you shut down your uh, you lose your data basically. If you if you are you are, you have this um, architecture during the weekend, you can if nobody's using nobody is using the, the compute, nobody's doing queries, nobody's using your app. Maybe you can just like reduce to the minimum your compute your compute layer and still still keep keep the the storage around. But it's a much more elastic uh, way to to do things. And so the pros is, uh, I guess I've been repeating myself for the last uh, 10 minutes now. And the pros is like, you can scale independently. You can use uh, dedicated hardware. Uh, the cons is 
usually increase complexity. You know, you have like two tiers that you need to manage. Uh, the network bandwidth can be called can become a bottleneck, and now you have like extra network latency. Before the data and the compute are located in the same space, so there's no latency. Like the computation has the data readily available. There's no transfer, so there's no bottleneck through the bandwidth, and also there's no added network latency. The network, the operational complexity, there's a way, there's a way around it. It's basically it's cloud object storage. Like in the cloud world, when you use uh, I don't know Amazon F S3 or like Azure uh, Blob Storage, you don't have to deal with the complexity of managing the storage at all. You you're dealing with uh, the serverless API, and uh, it has the nice benefits of uh, scale almost infin infinitely. Usually, uh, cloud, st cloud storage is very, very cost efficient. Um, maybe you have like a really, really good uh, operations team at your company, but it's still, it's still pretty hard to achieve the durability and availability that uh, uh, the cloud providers offer. Uh, so you get that for free. And then uh, cloud, cloud storage usually have like some nice features that you're gonna get for free basically. So they have like storage class classes, so those are classes that allow you to save money on data that you don't access very often. Uh, you also have like cross replication, cross region replication. So you can replicate your data pretty easily to like other uh, um, geographical areas. Uh, so that's something that's non really, really non-trivial to do uh, if you're hosting the data yourself. And one, if, if you're using cloud storage, you only, you only have to click Big a few buttons in your UI interface, and you, and you're done. You have like uh, replication for free, for instance. And the cons the cons are similar though. Like the network bandwidth is still a bottleneck, and you still have an extra network latency. So it seems it seems like shared disk is the is the new panacea. It's mag it's magic. It allows you to um, Scale scale your tiers independently. You you have like better durability, better availability. Uh, so it feels like every everybody should and could do it. Um, but it's it's a bit more complicated than that uh, because of the network that's in the middle of your your storage and your compute. You have to have relax the latency constraints, the throughput constraints, and only a few systems that have like. Uh, IO access patterns can actually afford to move to uh, a shared disk architecture. And so the reason QuickWit is able to decouple compute, compute uh, and storage is because we were able to uh, relax the constraints on latency throughput and also like make sure the IO, the IO pattern uh, allow for uh, using that architecture. So let's, let's me, let me explain some in more details. So relaxing the latency constraints. Every time you go to objects, cloud object storage, you pay, depending on your provider, you, a round trip is between like 50 and 100 milliseconds. Sometimes when you're lucky, like the, the P50 uh, latencies are, pre are pretty good. So you are around 50 milliseconds, sometimes below, but like the tail latency can be, can be quite high. Uh, so the round trip is really, really expensive. So it's really not suitable for like machine to machine low latency applications. Like every application that wants like really low latency, let's just say under hundred milliseconds, that's really not a good candidate for uh, moving the, the hot data to object storage. Um, so for search, for instance, um, e-commerce search is an example of applications that you don't want uh, to, you don't want to move your data for e-commerce search to S3 because it's it's been proven that after, I think it's three or 400 milliseconds, you actually start seeing revenue when the search experience is really not snappy. So there's just no way you're gonna do, you're gonna move your data to cloud storage for that kind of application. But there are some application where it's totally fine. Uh, I call them, we call them like human to machine applications. Um, so all the observability use cases, the security audit use cases when you have a human that's willing to 
to wait for like, I don't know, 300, 400, 500 milliseconds, maybe a second. Um, and that experience um, is, <laughs> I will, I'm gonna say like bearable. Uh, and so now you can actually think about uh, going using object storage because now the latency, uh, you, you, you can expect the latency in like a few hundred milliseconds using object storage. So that's what we do. We say, hey, you quick quit, use this object storage. Be careful um, for which use case you, you use it. Like just don't do e-commerce search with quick quit. It's not, it's not a good use case. For the, for the other use cases, go crazy. Um, now you also have a throughput constraint. If you look at the throughput of one connection to a three, uh, we measured it and we said we, um, our mental model at QuickWit is basically one connection is about uh, 100 megabytes per second. So S3 feels, feels pretty slow, like basically like a slow uh, spinning disk, uh, but definitely not like uh, an SSD. Uh, and so you can, you can, you can see where you, where you are on that, on that diagram between throughput latency. So very low throughput pretty high latency, so not, not great. However, what we can do with uh, cloud storage is because beyond, behind the hood, the, your data is uh, hosted by many, many mach machines and they're pretty good at load balancing. You can go crazy and can, you can issue like a lot of queries in parallel and you, you can issue like 10, 15, 20, even 30, maybe even more queries in parallel. And so now you can achieve a much higher throughput using parallel requests. So latency is only gonna be great. Like this, the latency that's totally non-negotiable, uh, but throughput, throughput can be really improved. So for in a quick quit use case, we make sure we plan the IO operations ahead. That means that you can't afford to um, throw start a request, wait for it to come back, start a request, wait for it to come back and do it, do it 30 times. What you have to do is like in advance, be like, plan your IOs and say, okay, I'm to, to do this computation, I'm gonna, I'm gonna need like 25 requests. And so as soon as the query arrives, you need to plan those requests so that it come, it, they can come back in time. So we plan the IO so that they run in parallel and they run asynchronously. And finally, you have to have uh, an, a compatible IO access patterns. And I think I think that those like the, the next few slides are actually the most important slides of the uh, of the presentation because they, they explain uh, how we do how we do what what we do and how, why we're able to do it. So as I was th as I was saying in the beginning, the indexing library you, library that we use is, is called 10 TV. And so uh, a piece of index is called a segment. And so if you trace the IO operations that are done just to open a 10 TV segment, not even to uh, perform a computation, get data from the segment, but just open it. And you trace that on your, if you could do it on your local machine, you realize that just to open the segment, um, the 10 TV segment, you issue 28 reads and you download like very little data, um, 30, 34 kilobytes. So because it all happens on your SSD, like and each each read takes like nanoseconds, you don't you don't you don't realize that this is this is happening on the road. But now you imagine you put your 10 TV, your 10 TV segment on um, object storage, you would have to multiply basically 28 by uh, 100. So we take 2,800 milliseconds to just to open your 10 TV segment. Uh, and that obviously wouldn't work because then on top of that, you would have to download the data, get it back. So what we had to do is use something a little bit different. So it's still based in on Tan TV, but we have a structure on top of it that we call the turbo index that basically wraps a Tan TV segment and 
that is basically pre-computing all the data that, that you're going to need for opening the, the town TV segment. So when that way, when the split is on object storage, instead of going there and asking for data 28 times, we only, we only go there one time and we get a tiny piece of data. And now we, we have everything we need to uh, perform the computation. So that trick, we do it, we do it for opening the, the index and we do it in a few other places to minimize the number of requests that we need to, to do to object storage to answer such a search query. So we use an index format that minimizes the number of random IOs and we're able to answer a search query in uh, at the minimum three requests. So that's why we're able to answer uh, in less than a second, because like worst case scenario, uh, each request takes 100 milliseconds by three, 300 milliseconds. It takes more, more time than that because we still have to like down, download, download some data and then uh, make process, process it. So um, use, some, use some compute. So obviously it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna take more time than that. Uh, but the reason we're still able to do everything in less than a second and sometimes more like if there's too much data we all will take one second two seconds even three seconds if the, the data set is large and we don't have enough machines of bandwidth um, but the only reason we were able to do so is uh, because we're able to pre-compute and uh, minimize the number of uh, ios that we we do to object storage so i won't since i presented uh Elastic search show nothing architecture. I wanted to show what, what it looks like in the quick quick world. So same thing, the data set that we call index composed of many documents. Uh, the index is divided into splits. So Elastic Search decided to use their the chunks uh, charts. We call them splits. So what we do is the data arrive through the API. We uh, compute the index and then we upload it to object storage. And then on the other side, we have like stateless search nodes that query the split straight from object storage. So I have a, I have a, a diagram here. So the same document arrives. Uh, it goes through a distributed queue. That's a pretty old diagram. We actually do have like a in JSTP like the same way Elasticsearch does now. We emit a split a split every thirty seconds. So that's that's one of the limitations that we have. Like for Elasticsearch, since they're working on local SSD, it's really easy to write data very, very often. Uh, it's not convenient for us to write data to S3 every 500 milliseconds. So we just have to wait uh, 30 seconds. We could we could do 15 seconds, but not that not much less. We have to wait a little bit to uh, accumulate enough documents, and then we upload the data to S3. So our, our time to search is not as good as uh, that of Elasticsearch. And then when, when we have uploaded that split to S3, we have a metadata layer where, that we update and we say, hey, there's a new piece of data available. And then on the search path, we still have that notion, that notion of root node. So when your query arrives, you go to root node, the root node goes to the metadata layer the metadata layer tells you what are the relevant split for your query. And then we go to each uh, leaf node. They work on a subset of the data. They work on a subset of splits. They go to S3, they get the data they need to answer the query. They do, they, they do the computation and then they answer the root node. The root node may or may not perform some additional aggregation and then your query is returned. Um, so the pros of this architecture, we are more super efficient because uh, we only index the document once. We're most usually more, more, more cost efficient for several reasons. So one, most because we're more super efficient because we, we use cheaper storage, like S3 is uh, cheaper than SSDs. Uh, another reason is elasticity. Uh, same same thing. Like if you, you don't, if your application doesn't doesn't need search over the weekend, you can just shut down your searchers, 
and the data remains on S3. Uh, it's because the nodes are, are stateless, it's really easy to remove and add nodes uh, in, a few, in a few seconds. Uh, so that reduces with like greater elasticity, which translates to like uh, better utilization. And basically you get a better uh, bang for your buck. Uh, so you, you, use the, you use the cloud uh, more efficiently. So that's, that's why we say that um, QuickWid is a cloud friendlier uh, than uh, Elasticsearch. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying all that Elasticsearch is bad. It still runs in the cloud and it runs great. It runs great. And if you're doing uh, e-commerce search, you should use Elasticsearch or any low latency uh, system. But for other use cases, uh, we may you 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 may benefit from grayscale saving, but maybe using a system like QuickWit. And last but not least, uh, operational burden and complexity is also reduced because basically you're using object storage, so you once again you get the availability durability for free um the cons like i said uh incompressible query latency of 300 to 500 milliseconds time to search um, of 30 seconds and finally slow mutability so we are able to support um, deletions only at a slow rate and we we support it just for like compliance reason uh, the reason is like our data our splits uh, they are on S3 and they're pretty big. So if you want to modify one document in there, you have to rewrite the whole thing. So it's really, it's really not, it's really not great if you have like a really high rate of uh, mutations. But if like every, I think, yeah, I think GDPR is it's, it's give you like maybe sixty days to get rid of the data. So if you you do like a huge batch of deletion every every sixty days. Uh, then you we we can handle it. If you do mutations every every hour of or every minute, um, this is not going to be a good use case. I feel like you're describing how the every time I unsubscribe from an email list, it takes them thirty or sixty days. They don't like to delete either. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> look, deletes have have been like an afterthought for a long time for like many many systems. Uh, and so I, very often it's a second, uh, second class citizen. Because like mm -hmm. I, when, when you, when you design a system, uh, and you, you know that the data is immutable or you, you, you force people into dealing with immutable data, then you can, you can take, you can take shortcuts so you can design things differently the way, the way we do, we're doing it with QuickWit. Uh, if you add the relations after the fact, it become it becomes much more trickier. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a small demo. I feel. Um, yes. So I feel like it's a quick read, and the, at the end of the day is an API. So that always makes for like very underwhelming uh, demos. Um, so here we have um, a data set. So this, uh, basically, this is the QuickWit UI. Um, I am running a Kubernetes cluster in our uh, demo environment. So I connect it to the UI. And the UI, the UI have uh, one data set, one index that's uh, from GitHub Archive. Uh, GitHub Archive is uh it's it's just that i said it's a public data set where all the events of git of github are available so it's it's a pretty cool data set to work with it has like a lot of data it has uh, a lot of uh text text data which is pretty good for elastic search um so unfortunately <laughs> there was some miscommunication with my co-founder and he scratched the uh, the index a few hours before I was supposed to present. So that index is, is not that big. We're not, unfortunately, we're not in terabytes. We, I think we're close to one terabyte. It's all indexing. Uh, so that's, that's one document. So let's do a search with my login. 
there's, we don't we don't have that many hits because we only have like I think a few a few weeks of, of data in there. I think it is there's like 300, 350 million documents last time I checked. So I guess in the in the in the last events that I, that I said my um, my my login came up uh, eight hundred um, fifty eight times, uh, and so you can see that here I probably opened an issue on the quick read repository. Uh, what did I do here? Uh, yeah, nothing interesting. So um, and obviously, obviously it's search, so you can you can search for text. So I probably say shoot very often in my issues. So I can run the query and in a bit like in a bit less than a second, there are 26, 26 hits uh, where I used found. Uh, we don't have a lighting, fortunately. Like as it should. Yeah, it should be should be possible to define them in a quick quick config, so on and so forth. Uh, Does it support be... wildcards or regular expressions? Uh, no, yet we 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 could we could we are working on we are working on it on the roadmap, but we don't have wildcard wildcard expressions right now. What we have is. Um, what we already have is, uh, for instance, that like really specific to search is like first queries. So if I say should be, it's gonna, it's not only gonna verify that you have should and be in the document, but it's gonna verify that uh, they're both one after the other. So if I if I search for should should be, uh, I I had how many hits before? Yeah, I had twenty six hits, and now I'm just I just have ten. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of, uh, and so in the next, in the next, it's still a young project. So we like, we like a bunch of feature, but um, the, the indexing technology, 10TV has regular expressions. So we should be able to uh, plug a regular expression quickly now in a quick way. So yeah, should be there. So what I want to, what I want to show now is um, how, it's basically reading from from history because now you could, you could you could say hey everything everything is in this in a cache it's fast because uh, you're not going to s3 because yeah we the, the the first query like we eat s3 and then we're not totally crazy you're like uh, a machine that still have like small ssd of you know memory so we, we cache some data structure so the following queries are, are um faster if you if you want it to be we have some different caching settings but what I want to show is, can you can you see my terminal? Yes. Yeah. Before yeah. you, I just one more question on that last yeah. screen. So, what you're searching right now is like JSON. Yes. Um, but it, like, what other structures do you support? We only support JSON right now. Okay. So we don't support CSV. We don't support protobuf, Avro. Uh, we only have one first class citizen, and it's, and it's, it's JSON. We we could add in the future. We don't have that. We do not have that many requests for other file formats. Mm -hmm. So I I was thinking, uh, like in here we are talking about searching logs uh, in the sense that these are uh, information uh, that are immutable that happen mm -hmm. like events or whatever it is that we want to call this. I imagine that if I uh, if I'm working, for example, on in social media, I want to I want to implement a query to see all of the like that I did in my Instagram, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. all, this would be appropriate, an appropriate use case. Yeah, if if every like is an event and the event doesn't change, yeah. And then we we also um, support aggregation, so you you should be able to do a sum of like so we 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 do support our use case. So, in uh, in this sense, uh, every time I can uh, collect information uh, in uh, for my system in the form of an, an event that happened mm -hmm. at some point, and I want to do a search on it like that. As you were saying, doesn't require uh, uh, like to stay to, to have a latency that is uh, mm -hmm. pretty pretty short. That is good use case for something like this. So there are uh, actually a, a really wide number of 
situation just because when I was when I was looking uh, uh, reading the abstract and I was uh, reading logs I wasn't mm -hmm. really sure but in reality it's not like just log in the sense of or a system that takes a log is yes. any type of activity that I can represent in that way so yes. even a, a stream of events that perfectly match mm -hmm. the yeah. case so I think we have a marketing issue there when we say, hey, QuickWit is for immutable data, I feel like it makes our messaging not super clear because not, not everybody knows exactly what, what it means. And so it, be, it becomes unclear uh, what they can do with QuickWit. Uh, and since at the, end of the day, at the end of the day, most people are interested in their logs, their traces, I think it's just easier for us to say, hey, it's really good for the use cases because this, this is also where the market is. Um, and that's why that's why we position quickly this way. But like some some users understand that, just not for logs and distributed tracing, they understand that anything that's immutable and that or can be modeled in an immutable way is a good is a good fit for quickwit. So if you need to do a computation like this, you were talking about retail before and of course, there are situations where uh, the response needs to be immediate, and so this wouldn't eventually qualify. But if you want to do this post facto, uh, like yes. collect uh, uh, information on your data, this mm -hmm. is totally appropriate. Yeah, exactly. Like you probably don't want to use QuickWit for like the the search of your e-commerce. You know, the search bar and then. The, the items that you want to buy because there you run really fast but maybe all those events you can log them and you can index them with quickly and then your analysts or like your dashboard they could be they could be powered by quickly correct so exactly i see this really powerful to to do re research uh, in uh, collect factors identify mm -hmm. pattern in the data all of this type of situation Mm -hmm. um, it's it's also pretty it's really good for security use cases because very mm -hmm. often in security you really have the needle in a haystack problem you're looking for the one user the one ip um, and the problem with like technologies that don't use indexes and basically they have to to scan the whole data set to find that unique ip or to find that unique user id whereas with search there's that data structure that is the index that pre computes the data basically and can really quickly tell you, hey, that IP, it's in that it's at that piece of data, that username. So it's really good for investigation, security, those uh, those are things. And and I'm also thinking, uh, I know I sound like a broken record to Cora because I always mention uh, edge use cases, but they are really a lot in my mind and I, I have a lot of focus over there. Um, the, for example, when you want to do some kind of post-mortem or you need to identify something that happens and you have all of this huge target of deployments and you collect mm -hmm. data from those deployments, mm -hmm. that this also would be a, a great engine to use for the same reason. Yes. So, yes, I think it's our favorite use case because you want to collect all that data and keep it because maybe you're going to need it, but maybe not. So if you have a couple system, you have to pay for that compute all the time because maybe you want to query the data. Whereas mm -hmm. if you use a system like QuickWit that they compute, they compute storage and compute, then you, like, you, you can more easily tell yourself, hey, I'm going to keep that data for like two weeks, a month, six months, and maybe I'm going to use it. And then the day you actually need it, you can spin up a few searchers or like many, many searchers if you have like a, a huge data set. And then you can, uh, you, you, can, you can do that forensic investigation. That's, uh, yeah, that's great. I, and I, I'm thinking uh, in uh, using, for example, a, pod, a, a public uh, cloud provider like AWS, you can uh, store all of this in a low cost uh, storage like Glacier yes. and mm -hmm. then bring back in S3 and do your job and then move back. And, and this operation per se is not particularly an overhead. No, 
No, yeah, we, we, you could do that. You could store the Bitcoin index for, I don't know, years if you wanted to, put in Glacier, forget about it. And then, I don't know, you're in a financial institution, uh, you have to keep all the transactions. And for some reason, like two years later, the, uh, the SEC is like, oh, like in January, three years ago, you did this or that, like give us the data. Uh, we need to know about person X or Y uh, that did this, then that, that would be a really good, uh, really good use case. Thank you. Um, something I want to show is if you see my uh, terminal, maybe I'll make it a little bit bigger. Yeah, I see you're scaling up. Yeah. I mean, scaling up or down, like zero. So yeah, down. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually, yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to scale down. Um, so this is going to crash my... Uh, So I'm going to wait for Kubernetes to, so those are my, the pods that are running in our small demo cluster. So I have uh, two meta stores. So it's that metadata layer. We have one generator, it's the process that's responsible for um, doing some cleanups basically when you delete uh, things, things around and you have searchers. So searchers are the stateless nodes uh, that we use that we use for search so at some point yeah so at some point they're gonna those not those nodes are gonna go away uh and what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna quickly uh spin up three searchers and then i'm gonna go back quickly in the in, in the in the ui um and see how much time it takes for the the, the, the searcher to come back up and answer the first query. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that, way, that way, I hope to convince you that the data was not on the searcher. It was uncached. It, was, it, it, came, it, it came straight from S3. So let's go back to the, yeah, this is broken. As you can see here, fail to fetch. All right, so three searchers. Uh, reopen the connection, mm -hmm. and now, now I'm waiting for my nodes to come back up. So, oh, I was much faster than when I tried it before. <laughs> <laughs> I was expecting more like 15 seconds. Anyway, so in less than, so I don't know, it took me like a few seconds to to do the whole thing. So let let's set up basically like in less than 10 seconds, the node had time to come back up. Um, they talk to each other through a gossip algorithm. So uh, come back together and talk together and then answer the query. And now, as I was saying, the, the, the following, yeah, the following, the following requests are going to be a bit, uh, uh, going to be faster. Uh, the reason being, if you go back to, if you go back to my slide, that thing that we call the turbo index, that's pretty small for each split, uh, we cache it. So the next, the next query are going to be even faster. So if I if I hit another piece of data, a split that was not in my first query, uh, it's going to be slower again. But the thing is, I think uh, that query is hitting all of them, so it's not. Uh, and right uh, now, when you cache, this is a local cache. You are not using something like Redis or other uh, mechanism. No. No, no, this is, um, this is uh, the, so we have, no, we don't have actually, we will have uh, storage tiers. So you could, right now we just, we just use in memory. So not all, not all data is in memory right now. Uh, the whole data set doesn't fit memory, but some PCs like that first, that first piece that uh, saves us one round trip, that's for sure in memory right now, because it's only a few, uh, a few kilobytes. So it's that in saves memory in all three nodes. Yeah, it's probably yeah, all three nodes probably. It's so it's yeah, it's 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 a few kilobytes. So this one we don't we don't download again, uh, but the rest of the data set uh, is not is not cached, and it's uh, it's for it's for sure more than the whole capacity memory capacity of the um, of the the cluster. So what what we want to what we hope to do in the future is have memory cache SSD cache. So let's say you have, I don't know, 
a week of data where we could do like cache uh, the last 24 hours on SSDs. The rest would be on S3. And so the queries on the last 24 hours would be basically almost as, all, as fast as uh, Elasticsearch on on that piece because it's already, it would be already there. So you have the, the, the best of both worlds. You could have like size your SSDs to uh, basically fit your hot data set. And for the long tail, you you would uh, you would use S3. So that, that's on a roadmap. It's not out yet, but it's for sure something that we have in mind. And I, uh, I would like to ask a little bit more uh, around uh, mm -hmm. the the caching mechanism and exactly dig, dig deeper uh, in uh, in this in this question that also que uh, Cora asked. So right now we have three searcher. So we have yes. three different pods that are running mm -hmm. and doing the search. So and I, I'm who is executing this query? All of the three nodes. Sir? Yes. Okay. So. Let's Sorry, all of the three pods. No, no. Yeah, the three, the three pods. So we have for the data set, we have many quick width splits. So a split is one piece of the, the index, basically. So that data set, um, two hours ago, it was, uh, I think it was uh, 30 plus splits. Uh, and each split is, uh, it's pretty large. It's, it's in the uh, gigabytes. So pretty, pretty quickly you get to, uh, 100 gigabytes, one, one terabyte, so on and so forth. Uh, so you, like I said, we have many, many splits and that's great because right now we have like three leaf nodes, just like the diagram. Mm -hmm. So one of the node is gonna act as, as the root node. So it, it's receiving my query, uh, okay. the, this query I'm typing. It's going to PostgreSQL and it's asking for, okay, which are the splits that are relevant uh, for that query? Um, because this, we have another mechanism that I did not, I did not explain is we, each split is responsible for, um, some time. So you can say, Hey, the, if, if the split was in deck, was created in the last 30 seconds, it's basically responsible for the last 30 seconds. Um, so for that query, actually, I didn't, I didn't precise, uh, I didn't use a time range, but if I were to filter on a time range, I would have less splits to, to query. So less data to, uh, download, less data to compute. But for that query, I did not, uh, I did not do that. So the metadata level is telling, is telling you which splits are relevant. And if, sorry, this will give you the turbo index. It will not give you the turbo index. The turbo index is as part of the split, it's actually a footer. So if I come back here, the root node is gonna say, hey, okay, let's just say there are 30 splits. So it's gonna mm -hmm. say, okay, I have 30 splits. I have three nodes. I probably should give like three, 10 splits to each node. So each leaf node uh, is in charge of performing the request for- Oh, okay. For 10 splits. Mm -hmm. And then we use like a rendezvous hashing algorithm to make sure that there's some affinity between the split, split ID and uh, the machine. So that if we redo that computation again and the same splits are targeted, then the same, mach the same machines are going to be used. That way, like hashing is more efficient. Okay. So each leaf node is going to be responsible for 10 splits. And okay. So if, if uh, each node it's going to take care of a portion. Of... Yes, yes. Okay. No. So if I, if I had only one node, then it would just do the work for like 30 splits. If I had five nodes, then I would do, each node would um, process six splits. So we will try to spread the load. And in terms of, uh... I guess there there are benchmarks to understand. Depending on the 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 size of mm -hmm. the split, what is that you? What's the best number of so nodes? So we try to produce uh, splits that are always more or less the same size. 
So we're really getting into like the, the, the internals of Quickwit, but basically we, we run merges. So if the throughput, let's say like you have more activity during the day and less activity at night. So the splits during the day are going to be bigger. What we're gonna do is the, the splits during the night, we're gonna merge them together. That way we have less splits to process. So we have a, we have a, we have a sweet spot of a number of documents uh, per split. And okay. so that, that, that drives how many, how many nodes you wanna have. But I, I actually like the main driver is like the bandwidth. Um, for us, like if you tell me you can have like one instance with uh, basically what we're trying to optimize is like the number of uh, gigabyte of bandwidth per call. So we, we're not we're not particularly interested in like huge machines uh, with uh, normal um, network interfaces. We'd rather have more machine that bring us more network. So I'm trying to find a good example for this. Um, let's just say I have the choice between um, two machines. Yeah, two machines that have like, I don't know, uh, 10 gigabyte network interface and eight CPUs or two machines, um, Two machines with uh, 10, 10 gigabyte network interface, but more CPUs. I think we would rather get more of those machines that are less CPUs than the same bandwidth, because uh, the, the bigger ones are going to be more expensive, but they're not going to give you like more network. And actually, like we, we tend to saturate the network uh, more easily. So we'd rather choose machines that give you like a, a good ratio of like. Uh, compute power to to networking, which I think okay. which I think is a um, like in Shen nothing like network is important, but you're not usually you're not optimizing for uh, networking. You're more optimizing for like density. So you want uh, you, the ratio you optimize usually is like I don't know memory per CPU, for instance. And we're more looking at CPUs per uh, uh, network. Okay, that's. Really interesting. I I like to ask more, but I I feel like <laughs> for uh, for now we already have a yeah. great. So I think overview. yeah, I think I I think I quickly be pretty excited about this slide because we just as every time the network gets better, like every time the the network gets two times better, quickly get gets ten times better. Mm. So we're really looking for like if you look at the machines available on AWS. Uh, like the smaller machines, they usually have a network interface and that's great. It's like 10 gigabyte or 25. Uh, and then if you want a much stronger um, network interface, like actually like the ratio of like gigabyte, network gigabyte per, per CPU is actually not interesting. So really hoping that eventually like small instances will have like much better network. So we can do, we can do a, more, more, more efficient uh, downloads. So, okay, being this so communication bound, uh, you are saying uh, the, so I understand that the, the memory needs also to increase as you have more bandwidth, correct? The, 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 the CPU, sorry, needs also to increase as you increase uh, the, the bandwidth uh, of your network. Uh, yeah. But it's yeah. really the bandwidth that drives everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically we have a sweet spot where uh, we have like, I don't know, we want I don't know, like, let's just say like two gigabyte by CPU, which is, I don't know, it's just, and after that, we'd rather have more, more calls and CPUs that just hiding network per CPU. I don't know. It's, it's a different way of thinking when you're like mostly bound by the network. It's this is still it's still a map reduce model, right? Yes. So that yeah. and that reduce is happening on the root node. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So you're just favoring the more the more splits you have the better. The more the more you split the data, the better. Uh yeah, to to a certain point, like at some point you do like you do way more, you do too many requests, and then you can't amortize the latency with uh, like uh, getting getting um, a ch a chunk that's big enough. Like there's really no point going to paying like fifty to hundred milliseconds to get like a few bytes. So when you when you're going to cloud storage, it, it takes a long time. So you wanna you wanna make sure you went there for a good reason. Uh, if if it takes like 50 seconds to go to the object storage, but it takes only one millisecond uh, to do actually download the data, then the cost, the latent, the list, the latency cost is not amortized. So it's it's it makes more sense for us to like download bigger chunks so mm -hmm. that the cost of going to cloud storage is uh, amortized. And then from just from a cost perspective, I mean, this, the, the pods, those three pods, when you restarted them, basically they, uh, they had to re sort of hydrate their local cache of those little quick wit. We, uh, yeah, we don't do rehydration. Or they had to re recreate, I guess, maybe the cache. They had to recache. They lost their in-memory cache. Yeah, they, they lost it. We don't do anything. We're just waiting for the first query. So you, you, so you that, build up that, the cache from scratch. Yeah, so that, that first query is going to be more expensive. Uh-huh. So then, there's since, no like, because uh, I'm thinking just of the scenario, because this looks like it's like uh, like partway on the road, on the journey. Like I'm just thinking about like if, if those nodes were functions, if like if it was really efficient and you really don't want to run them when you don't need them, they could be functions, but then you lose the fact that their memory, that their cache is in memory. Uh, does it like, is there a scenario where they would work well as functions? And uh, I, I think, I think there is sometimes we, we talk about it. We haven't done it, but there's not normally our searchers should be able to, to run in lambdas. Mm -hmm. You you would if, have to keep the cache, I guess, somewhere. They would, closer. They would no, they would be just uh, a little bit, um, Slower. They just be slower. Yeah. Yeah. They would, would be slower because the yeah, they would take the hit. Uh -huh. But technically, they, we could go. We could do, we could do everything with lambdas. Um, maybe the um, the aggregation at the end, like the the merge part of the map reduce, basically, you would have to do it on the client, I guess, because it's, mm -hmm. it's. I don't think it's possible to connect lambdas together. So that would be a difference. Mm. But otherwise, we should be able to execute our search our queries on lambdas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so is, uh, can you scale up your replica? Like right now you have three. Let's yes. say that you want to uh, double that. So you go to yeah. six. Mm -hmm. What should you do for uh, to gain an advantage? Do you need to go back to zero and restart? Or can you add on the fly? And then what would happen to what's already cached? Um, so you can, you can add them and we use rend rendezvous hashing, uh, to preserve, uh, the, the affinity. So I think you would have some nodes like the, the nodes that were up before some of them would still work on the same splits. Mm -hmm. Actually, I don't, I don't, I don't remember exactly what's the, what's the policy of like basically our routing algorithm. Uh, I think for the, um, it's hard to say what's going to happen because basically some splits are going to have a little bit of data cache. Mm -hmm. uh, some splits are not going to the same node as before. They're going to a new node, so they'll pay a pen you'll pay a penalty. But at the same time, each, uh, each node is going to process less splits. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's hard for me to predict what's going to happen. Yeah, it was more to understand mm -hmm. if there is the possibility to do a scale up or in general, uh, and considering that anyway, it was pretty fast, uh, doesn't really, that was more a curiosity if can adapt at the scaling up or if we need any way to scale down and then. No, no, you can, you can, yeah, you don't have to go down and then up again. You can, you can always go up if you want or go up and down and then up again.
This was great. Yes. Thank you. Really so much. interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and we had uh, we have a few people at this hour. We have one person left. So Santos, thank you for sticking around until the very end. We appreciate it. And um, thanks. Thank you, thanks, Santos. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Adrian. Yeah, this is uh, it's it's really interesting, and that demo was uh, it is impressive. Also, I didn't know about that GitHub archive. That's cool. Yeah, it's a cool data set. <laughs> it's good to know that it's there. So yeah, we were really grateful that you uh, came on the Cloud Native Meetup. Um, and we're grateful that you're sharing all this information with us. We wish you the absolute best of luck with BitQuick. Thank you. And uh, yeah, Gabri, any closing words? Uh, no, I think uh, you said it all. And uh, as soon as we have the recordings ready, we're going to post and share with you the link. OK, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Sounds great. Uh, all right, I'm going to stop the recording. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.